Alrighty. Whew. Just made close. it. That you was close. Made. That was close. I almost was unprepared. There's so many tasks, so many things going on. Yeah. So well, now everyone's watching our little things going on. Are starting to tune in and wonder what we're talking about. Yeah. So. Well, good afternoon, folks that are tuning in right now. If you're or just tuning in, our host live. just made it. In the nick <laughs> like, of time. Dove over the pews to land in my seat, my notes. You missed a very fold, exciting time. Folded and you them in, on just one minute earlier. That's right. Folded them in midair, avoided knocking awesome. over the backdrop. It was great. Awesome. Yep. Uh, but for those of you that are tuning in right now, welcome. Whether you're watching live right now at 3 p.m. on Tuesday Eastern Time or whether you're watching... Uh, at a later point in time on demand, we're certainly glad to have you join us. We are back, Shane. It's Tuesday again already. Yeah, I love oh, it. This, this is one of my favorite days now. Really? That, yeah. that is awesome. That yeah. is the great rest to hear. Of the, the rest of the day is filled with meetings, and this is the <laughs> one time to to talk about Sunday again and yeah. and really go a little bit deeper into the sermon. I, I enjoy it. Very I, good. I don't know if anyone else enjoys it. I if you do, comment. Let me know. If you hate it. Let me know that too, because we could save the half hour. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's, we could do other things like yeah. play on our phones or yeah, something. Yeah, we could do you know, yeah, Social Candy media. Crush, whatever <laughs> might be. Yeah, so forth. No, actually, I've, it's been really cool to have. I've been sitting in the lobby before service starts on a Sunday, uh, and such, and to have folks come up and say, "Hey, those lives that you do with Shane, those are really, really helpful. They really help me understand the sermon better and come up with ways to apply it to my life." So. There's there's yeah. definitely people that are enjoying this. So. Well, I, it's a great conversation, so thank you for joining us. Absolutely. And so uh, for those of you that caught the sermon this past Sunday, this was part three of the MOVE series, and Shane talked about how to put our faith into action. It was an awesome sermon as always, and we would love to know if you had any questions, comments, or thoughts about the sermon. Uh, please go ahead and use the comments area right now, whether you're watching live or on demand, doesn't matter. We will get your comments. But if you're watching live, you have uh, the special opportunity of having this guy yeah. answer on the spot. Love to so, do that. That's right. Please ask questions. So for those that don't know, this is our lead pastor, Shane Schlesman. I'm communications director, Jim Washock. And Shane, let's get into it because we've right. got some pretty meaty questions this week. Uh, this week was your sermon was... Uh, it basically contrasted two stories or two people within a similar story. And that is, for those that don't know, is King Saul mm -hmm. and then his son, Jonathan. And they both um, put their action or put their faith into action in two different ways. Yeah. Uh, or, king Saul was or, yeah. the first king of Israel. Yeah. His son was really became a general commanding uh, part of the army as well. Mm -hmm. There was about 3,000 men following Saul, 1,000 following Jonathan. So this is a pretty, uh, pretty amazing gathering of people here in one spot and so we took a look at that passage and two very contrasting stories between Saul the king mm -hmm. and Jonathan his son. Indeed very 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 contrasting and if by chance you missed a sermon it is available on our website at weag.org w-e-a-g.org you can also catch it on our YouTube channel which is weag tv so you can search it there it's also on the Facebook page but our YouTube channel is perhaps probably the easiest way to find it in case you're watching this at a later point Yeah, in we time. also have a lot of other content on our YouTube channel as well. So yeah. check that out. You can subscribe to that. We'd love to get you some different content every week. Definitely, definitely. So, uh, Shane, I figured a question this week. Why don't we go into this contrast yeah. Yeah. that you uh, highlighted in, in the service? So let's start with Saul. Okay. And one thing about his story now that maybe, um, uh, well, let's just start with the question. I was going to set it up a little bit, but I, I don't want to spoil a later no, question. Yeah, so I don't, I don't want to do that. These good questions. Yeah. yeah. The question is, is how do we know from Scripture that Saul was supposed to wait and not act? Why, how do we know he was supposed to wait on the Lord and, not, and, and do so in faith and not act prematurely? It's a great question because, in fact, if you read the story and you place yourself in Saul's shoes, most of us would judge a CEO, a business leader, a nonprofit leader, president, uh, a leader of a business group, uh, a church even, would judge them for not acting. Mm -hmm. Because in Saul's situation, uh, the men were scattering. And there was a good reason for them to scatter, Jim, because in the story in 1 Samuel 13, if you want to read it, uh, it says that the Philistine army that was mounting against them were more numerous than the sand on the seashore. That's a lot of people literally uh, impossible to count, innumerable soldiers. So this was causing a massive panic and people were leaving. 
But the re to answer your question, why Saul should have known to wait, uh, let me handle the legality side of it, the, the legalistic or the rule side of it okay. first, and then the heart side. Uh, legalistically speaking, or just in the sense of what the rule was or the agreement was, in 1 Samuel 13, it actually says um, that this was the agree, agreed upon time, that he would wait seven days in Gilgal. Okay. So he would wait at this location for seven days, and then the prophet Samuel would come, and he would offer up a sacrifice to the Lord, uh, Jehovah, mm -hmm who they worshiped and uh, they believed that God would then bless them as they went to battle. By the way, they were going to battle because God had wanted them to use the nation of Israel to act out his promise in saying this promised land, the Philistines were now infringing on that promise. Mm -hmm. And so God said, no, that's not gonna happen. So they gather everybody together Saul knew that he should have waited okay. because he agreed to wait. Okay. He said he would wait, and it says that literally, but that also would have been a law, and you don't even have to know the Bible to just read it literally black and white. It just says uh, he knew he was supposed to wait seven mm -hmm. days. So it was not really questionable. No, like, it wasn't questionable. He, okay. There was an agreement. Yeah. And secondly, there was a law that the, only the prophet, only the uh, Lord's anointed um, uh, priest mm -hmm. would be able to be the person who presented that offering. Okay. So that that was not to be the king. Israel wanted a actual king, but before this time, Saul was the first one. But before this, they were actually ruled by the prophets, and the prophets would give. They would go to the Lord in prayer and ask God what He wanted the nation of Israel to do, and they would come and then communicate that mm -hmm. to the nation. But the nation of Israel wanted their own king. So they said, okay, we'll do that, but here are some rules. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And one of them was that the king doesn't get involved in offering sacrifice to the Lord. The prophet still goes to the Lord, asks what should we do next, and they wait, and then they take action and direction from God, not the king. Okay. But the king took over in this moment. Yeah. That's why it would have been a problem. Both King Saul knew what he was doing, the men knew he was what he was doing. Jonathan, his son, knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And the prophet did as well because when the prophet said, when he showed up, he said, what have you done? Mm -hmm. And immediately King Saul defended himself and said, you weren't here. You said you'd be here in seven days. Well, I don't know exactly what time of day it was. <laughs> we, the scripture doesn't tell us. Yeah. But apparently he was saying, you knew the agreement. Mm -hmm. You knew what time, you knew I would be here. And you also knew you shouldn't be doing it. So he said, you've done a foolish thing. So that's how we know okay. Saul technically did know that he was literally supposed to wait. This wasn't a figurative. Yeah. This wasn't symbolic. This was actually literal as well. Right. So that's the first part. Okay. Now, uh, for those of us in 2018, yeah. uh, where most of us aren't fighting ancient battles. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hopefully not. We don't have the same circumstances. We may feel it many days. If you have boys in your house, they usually dress <laughs> up and act like they are. This is a good time of year around Halloween. They're all dressing up as ancient soldiers. Yeah. But no, I realize not, we're not usually having battles in our neighborhood. No, and sometimes in the corporate office, you may feel like you're off yeah, to battle you, you or might so feel forth like too. And I could use a prophet to show up right now and present an <laughs> offering. But Shane, how do we in the light of the fact that our context isn't the exact same as Saul, what can we glean from his story as far as how we, how, how does that help us to know when we are to wait in faith? It's such a great question. I, I wish I had a great answer to this to mm -hmm. have a, a legal answer because Saul actually knew better than we did. Mm -hmm. The prophet said, wait <clears throat> seven days. Don't you wish God would say to you, yes. Jim, wait seven yes. days, and yes. on the seventh day, I'm going to give you an answer, yes. whether you're going to battle or not. Yeah. I'd be good with that. Be now, awesome. that seven days would be a nightmare to wait. I'm sure you'd be agonizing and wringing your hands over the seven days, but at least you'd know. Yes. And we have all these communication methods now. So yeah. God, just tweet me. Tweet me. <laughs> text me. Message me. Direct message. Post That's me. Right. Anything. Anything. Um, yeah, but... But that isn't the way it works. Right. So we have to look at the principle in the story and learn from that. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think there's so many things we could learn. Let me just point out a few. Okay. One is so often in, in life, we're looking for direction. And we think that 
the information should determine our direction. Hmm. So we have a pros and cons list, right? How many pros and cons lists <laughs> do you have going right now? I have pros and cons. Yeah. There are pros. Here are the pros of make, taking this action. If I wait, here's what's going to happen. So wherever has the most pros wins the directional battle. Mm -hmm. And or we never take action. Um, both are, are extremes. But how do we know we should wait? Well, I think in this story we learn that God, uh, I don't think God was asking Saul to wait and because he somehow didn't, um, couldn't conquer the Philistines. Okay. In fact, the end of the story, God ends up conquering the Philistines mm -hmm. and they never fight one battle, which is a good thing since the Philistines had cut off all their ability to make weapons and every blacksmith was already dead in the country. There was no way to make weapons. Mm -hmm. So they had two swords in the entire army, one for the king, one for the king's son. That's it. <laughs> if you weren't one of those two people, you're it's out of luck. It's not good odds. Not, not good, good odds. odds at all. But God actually didn't need them at all. Yeah. He turned the Philistines against themselves and won the battle in the end. But in the beginning, Saul didn't know that. And all he saw were people scattering. He went from 3,000 men following him and 1,000 following his son down to 600 people. Mm -hmm. He was desperate. And I don't know if you've ever been there, but I think what we learn from the story is what should not determine our decision. A result or the circumstances will skew your decision if that's the determining factor. Okay. Direction is determined by God. It doesn't mean that I don't have information that informs me. Mm -hmm. Information informs I should come into a decision eyes wide open. Boy, if I wait another day before making this decision, my business could go under. I mean, that's a, that's a huge factor. Mm -hmm. And it does inform us, but should it determine our direction? And, and to me, what we learn from the story is that God doesn't, it's not like God needs you to slow down because you're moving so fast in life. He's the creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. It's not like you can outrun God or like, boy, God, have you not been paying attention? I've been working so fast here. Here, let me catch you up on the situation. I'm going to lose my business yeah. Yeah. tomorrow if I don't get this deal. Yeah. So let's get busy here. I'm not sure if you've been with me. Mm -hmm. God's, it's not like God's out in the field uh, smelling the roses and just meandering through a field and we got to catch his attention. Hey, 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 stop daisy uh, picking. We got to get to work here. Right. Um, we think that waiting on God is us waiting for God to catch up. And my point Sunday, and I think the point of this passage is that waiting on God is God waiting for us to catch up. Okay. Some of us have been waiting for God to catch up and he's been waiting for us. Mm -hmm. Because what I mean is, is while you're waiting on that answer, God wants to do something very specific in you while you wait. He doesn't need the doctor's uh, approval. He doesn't need your financial advisor's approval. He doesn't need this deal to come through. He's got six other deals coming through where that came from, but he wants to you. He needs you. He doesn't need those circumstances. He needs you to come to him. And we've been asking God to come to us. Mm -hmm. God, come to my situation. Come fix my situation. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And God's like, no, 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 no. Come to me. That's the point of the altar. That's the point of the sacrifice. Okay. Saul moved ahead without God. Yeah. And in our lives, we do that so often. We move on and make a decision based on information rather than the direction from God. And what I mean by that is I haven't directed myself to God in order to be directed by God. Hmm. Before I'm directed by God, I have to direct myself to God. So perhaps in Saul's situation, he should have acted, but he should have acted not with what he did, but in moving closer to God. Yes, he should have led the 600 men that were left <clears throat> or whoever, mm -hmm. and said, let's pursue God, not the enemy. Yeah. And instead, Saul was panicked, looking as, as I would have been, you would have been, most oh, yeah. of us would have been. We get that kind of leadership, you know, it's reactionary. And we live in reaction because we're not rushing to God. And the point of the sacrifice, the point of the altar, 
the point of all of that was to get Saul and the rest of his men to come to God first, mm -hmm. then to act. That's different. Yeah. So let's go ahead and contrast this with Jonathan, yeah. his sure. son, because Jonathan, you explained how he actually appropriately acted in faith. Yeah. Uh, he acted uh, instead of waited. Uh, when others were waiting. Yeah. So how do we know from Scripture, I'm going to ask you basically the same question, how do we know, uh, this is all caps no, from Scripture, that Jonathan was right in acting and not waiting? Yeah, it's such a great question because here are two men who both acted. Mm -hmm. One was condemned for his action. The other was blessed. What was the massive difference? Yeah. And the massive difference was um, that Jonathan waited too. While everyone was scattering, by the way, Jonathan acted alone. It said he had a thousand men following him. I don't know how many he had left. Mm -hmm. it, it only talks about 600 total. I don't know if that was Saul's men or of everyone. But still, the point is, is that Jonathan got up in the middle of the night and he acted and told his armor bearer, there are Philistines gathering on the other side of this ridge. Let's go and maybe God will deliver us. He didn't even know if God was going to live. Yeah. So what was the difference? Both men acted, and God ends up blessing Jonathan and giving them this miraculous victory with only two people. Mm -hmm. And Saul ends up being condemned and losing his throne because of taking action ahead of God. And I think the difference is huge because Jonathan was the one who waited while everyone else scattered. He was the one who teaches us that sometimes you need to pursue God while everyone else is pursuing answers. You need to go and pursue God because God wants to do a work in you while you wait. We think of waiting as passive. I'm just waiting on God. I don't know what's going to happen, Jim. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just waiting. No, 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 no. I'm pursuing God. This is a season while I don't have answers. I'm pursuing God. Instead of pursuing answers, if we were pursuing God like Jonathan was, mm -hmm. then we would know with certainty when we get up in the morning, we would go, I know what to do. Mm -hmm. And Jonathan waited for the sacrifice. Samuel did show up. And after Samuel showed up, on the very night after the sacrifice was made, with complete and total peace, Jonathan had in his heart. Mm -hmm because he had waited, he had pursued God during the waiting time. He wasn't passive, he was active in his waiting. And then he had peace in his heart to know, hey, whatever we do, God's gonna be in it. Yeah. Have you ever just had that when you yeah. walked away after spending time with God? If you're not a person of prayer, I'd encourage you, spend some time in prayer and then go to work. You'll be amazed how it will change mm -hmm. your lens of everything you see. You start to go, wow, I feel total. I'm going to just do this. I mean, the other thing Jonathan teaches us, teaches all of us, is that all of us know something good to do while we're waiting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, Jonathan's like, I don't know if he had in his heart. He didn't say we're going to conquer them. He didn't even know if that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. But he was like, I know where they're camped. <laughs> I, I, and I know that God said he promised us this promised land. Yeah. And, and he said that we're going to be victorious. Mm -hmm. I don't know, even know what that's going to look like, but I know the promises of God. So I'm going to do what I know to do. I'm going to go ahead and go over there and make myself available. And maybe, maybe God will use me. Maybe God will put me in a situation. Yeah. And he, he decided to act on what he know. And I, how I would apply that in our lives today in 2018 is right now you're at work maybe watching this with your headphones on, hopefully, so your supervisor doesn't get you in trouble. <laughs> but, but maybe you're, or maybe you're at home and, and maybe you're a stay-at-home mom with kids right now. Maybe you're a teacher who's uh, just getting off school or you're in a study hall or watching this quietly. Um, but you know something that you can do right now. In fact, you know somebody who needs help. Maybe somebody's already approached you today. Maybe somebody that you blew off earlier in the day because you didn't have time. And that was the real mission of the day. Mm -hmm. and, and you did the busyness of the day, but you didn't actually do the mission of the day. 
And that comes from God. And Jonathan pursued God so he knew what the mission was. He was clear in his heart what the mission was. There are so many things that we already know. And in fact, we're living in a time that Jonathan and Saul weren't. We have the entire Bible, a collection of books. The Bible is actually a collection of many, many, many books, both historical, scientific, uh, have every kind of proof imaginable, but even if you don't accept any of that, this is a story told by a prophet who really lived, who really existed, for a king who really lived, who really ruled during a time, who had a son who really lived, and who really did some of the things that we're reading about. Mm-hmm. And they acted knowing that there's something they could do. When in doubt, do something. I was just reading from Erwin McManus. Um, he wrote the book uh, called Chasing Daylight, and mm-hmm. he actually uses this story. As well, yeah. Uh, he uses okay. Jonathan as a great case study for what to do. And, he, and here's how Erwin McManus said it. Um, when you don't know what to do, do something. <laughs> <laughs> just do something. Yeah. Sounds like a really... Uh, beautiful concept, right? Uh, yes. This great deep truth. Uh, it's just so simple. But now, Erwin McManus doesn't mean do anything. Mm-hmm. He's saying act in the good that you know to do. All of us, if you are a follower of God, you know many things good that you ought to do. In fact, why not act on one of them? This is why it's so important to read the Bible. It goes all the way back to how uh, the, the Satan entered into the Garden of Eden back in the beginning of creation. Sorry to get kind of really Bible on you right now, but but in their very beginning of creation, the very first story of good versus evil, evil came to Eve, the first woman, and said to her, did God really say not to eat of this tree? That's the same strategy he's using today. Yeah. Did God really say that that's wrong? Did God really say that you should do that? Did God really say, well, if you don't know what God says, how do you know what is good to do? So Mm -hmm. I just said a lot there, I know, but but that's in 2018, how we can be a little bit more like Jonathan in our daily lives and, and do something that we know to do. But while we're waiting, we're not sure what to do, pursue actively, don't wait passively. Be active in your waiting, pursuing God. Then with great peace, know that whatever you put your hand to, God is in it. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of how we utilize a GPS in that mm. we, we give it a destination. We, we have a starting point. We give it a destination. The GPS doesn't tell us every turn, everything that's going to happen. Good point. That's sort of a fog to us. All it's doing is saying, this is the next thing that you need to do. Yeah. Um, and it's almost and like that's what Jonathan did. if you turn another way, did. it's not like you can't reroute. Exactly. <laughs> so it's like Jonathan knew. Uh, yeah. It's like you were saying. Jonathan knew God's given us the victory. I already know that. I don't know every turn between here and there, how that's going to play out, but I know I can at least move in that direction. So good. Start heading in the direction. That's good. So it's a God positioning system. That's it. I like that. That's GPS. God positioning system. It's not cheesy at all either. (laughs) No, not at all. Um, Shane, towards the uh, conclusion of your sermon, you said this quote, some of you have all the wood that the altar needs. What you need is the fire. What did you mean by that? What, what is the wood, the altar, and the fire? What do they symbolize? And how do we obtain this fire that you're talking about? Yeah, now that I'm hearing you back say that back to me, I, sub, I think subconsciously I had that in my head. I just realized where that came from. Okay. I actually didn't originate that. Okay. I should have given him credit. Uh, I didn't realize I was uh, quoting him until just now. But actually, Erwin McManus said okay. that. Um, he said that from the same book from chasing daylight chasing daylight um and he said i believe he says that i believe that's where i got it from um now that i'm thinking about it Mm -hmm. is he said um what what we lack is is not the wood we lack the fire i think that's how he said it so what 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 here's what i meant by that i'm not going to speak for erwin now. now i'm speaking for me um to be clear what i mean by that is this I think we have all the elements of worship. Mm -hmm. We have all the elements of I believe God, I believe, uh, maybe you believe in something, you believe in something out there, you even pray, you even come to God. You might be a church person who comes, you might have been here Sunday at West End Assembly of God, you might have heard this sermon live and said, I was one of the people out there, I heard it live, I was there worshiping. We have all the elements of worship. But let's be sure that we don't just have all the elements of worship 
and, and miss the most important, which is if God's not in it, then we lack the fire. Okay. You can have, you can know what to do and do it the wrong way. Mm-hmm. Saul knew what to do. He said, and, and literally in First Samuel 13, Saul says, bring me the elements of the sacrifice. I will take care of this. So he knew what was needed and he, he knew, knew the process. He knew it. He even knew what to do. But that wasn't enough. He had seen yeah. it plenty of times. They'd gone yeah. into battle before. This wasn't the first time that he made an agreement with Samuel the prophet of mm-hmm. meet me here. And after these amount of days of collecting the troops, I will show up. And when I show up, I'm going to bring the He knew what to do. Mm-hmm. A lot of us know what to do. I'm not saying we need a priest or we need a person to offer that up. That's not today. Jesus said that you can come to the Father yourself. You can approach the Father in heaven yourself. You can pray to him right now in this moment. You could be driving down the street. You don't need to close your eyes. Please don't do that. Uh, well, you could be, you can talk to God. He hears you. In fact, you don't even have to say it out loud. Let that blow your mind. You can just think it. Mm-hmm. God is present with you if you invite him to do so. He says, behold, I stand at the door at knock. That's real good King James Version there. Behold. behold. Uh, I, I, I. <laughs> But hey, listen, I'm here. I'm ready. Just invite me in. Mm-hmm. And I, anybody who invites me, I'll be there. You invite me, I'm in that car with you. You invite me into that moment, I'm with you in that moment. We have the elements of coming to God down. Mm-hmm. We know how to do the right thing, look good, look the part. But what we need is the fire inside us. Jonathan had that. Yeah. I mean, listen yeah, to the story. Like, it's crazy, man. And his He's armor like, bearer, too. Makes him up in the middle of the yeah. night. Yeah, and his armor bearer is like, <laughs> yeah, whatever nuts. you have in your heart, do it. I'd be like, go ahead and do it. I'll be right here <laughs> in this camp. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know how that works out for you. And then when they get down to the valley, it's the Bible says Samuel records this amazing story where Jonathan and his armor bearer show themselves. Mm. And they're sitting ducks at the bottom of a cliff with the, with the Philistines looking down on them, with the, obviously with the high ground, laughing yeah. at them, yeah. literally laughing at them and saying, look, the dogs of Israel here, they, they come out of their holes, come out of their hiding because everyone in Israel had already scattered and hid like normal smart people would do. Mm-hmm. Right. And here's Jonathan. He had fire because God put that there. Let me tell you, that's not insanity. That's the fire of God. And sometimes it doesn't look logical and it doesn't make a lot of sense. But when God's in it, he inspires us to do it. Mm. And that's what I desire in my life. Don't you love, won't you desire to have that? We just know. You just know that you know that you know that you know that this is what I need to do. You just know you should do it. It doesn't even make sense. But you have a peace. The Bible calls a peace that passes all understanding. No person you could explain it to. It doesn't make sense. You just know some of you are listening to this uh, live stream after the fact, but God knew exactly the moment you'd be listening to it, and he's reminding you of something you already know that you should do. You already know what you should give up. You already know what you should act on. You already know the truth. You already know what's the right thing to do, but you're not doing it. Hmm. Just do it. And what we lack is not the knowledge we have the knowledge. We know what to do. Yeah. What we need is God working in us to be inspired to do it. So why are we so often so timid to actually act, to, to have this breakthrough, to fulfill the purpose that God wants for our life? Are we just, are we fearful? Do we doubt the distractions? Are we, are we content with I mean, our, our modern lives? Here's what, the, what is here's it? What the simple answer, man. Yeah. The simple answer is not enough time with God and okay. too much time with everybody else. Okay. Because everybody else speaks logic to us. Sure. Oh, I don't know if you should do that. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, boy, I don't know. I remember when I gave up my business to go into ministry, uh, two different times I did that in my life. People lo- talked to me like I was insane. Mm-hmm. Talked to me like I had three heads. I'm like, mm-hmm. what is your problem? Are you crazy? Don't do this to your family. Don't be a fool. This is so unwise. But when you spend time enough time with God, uh, that's why the Holy Spirit, to get a little biblical on you here, the Holy Spirit is the third person of God that actually, when you say, I invite God into me, mm-hmm. his Holy Spirit is the one who can live in you. And when we activate God in our lives and we spend time with him, that Holy Spirit becomes, and the Bible actually calls it a fire, calls it a fire that just 
builds up in us. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote to churches, he would write to young pastors. And he would say, fan the flame, fan the flame of, of what God is doing inside of you. Mm -hmm. In other words, spend time with him. Let the Holy Spirit come into your life. Spend time with God, more time with God than you do listening to other people. When you're talking, if you have a big decision going on in your life, spend time with God. You know what to do. Let God give you the fire to do it. All right, very good. Well, we need to end on those words right there because, <laughs> man, you're spitting fire at speaking of that woo. right there. Uh, for those of you watching, once this is posted, just, just rewind those few minutes. Just keep watching them. Watch them every morning. Uh, yeah, that yeah. might be uh, what you need to, to get on your knees and spend a bit, few That's more minutes with God. That's what I need, too. I need, to, I, so. need, I need the exact same thing. I'm, just, I'm no different than you. I need God activating passion and fire inside me to yeah. do what I know to do. Yeah, we can all benefit from that for sure. And Shane, what are we looking forward to in this week four of MOVE coming up this Sunday? I'm really excited about this coming week because this week is a tangible, we've been talking about MOVED. Mm -hmm. What moves the heart of God? What does it look like when we're moved by the same things that God is moved by? And we're actually going to give you a very tangible thing of what it looks like. We're gonna give you a tangible mission this Sunday. Okay. Of how you can make a difference just by doing one simple thing. I'm not gonna tell you what it is. I'm gonna just tell you, I'm gonna give you one simple thing that you, every person I believe can do mm -hmm. that would change the world. All right. Literally, it would change the world. And I think we can all probably handle one simple thing. One, it's going to be Despite one simple thing. Despite everything on our plate, we could probably handle one simple thing. You could handle this one. Well, you're going to have to just wait till Sunday, 10 a.m. to learn what that is. Um, so please be sure to join us online or on site this Sunday. I think it's the, the 2nd, November 2nd, I hope. I'm um, trying to pull that off on the top of my head. Fourth. The 4th. Okay. Uh, the 4th. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, Sunday, you come November on fourth. second to Friday. Yeah, you can, you can come Friday hang out season. a little bit, sure. But you're not going to find out what this one thing is no, you on the no. second. No. So join us Sunday, November 4th at 10 a.m. on site or online, and you'll find out what this is when we go into part four of Moved. Thank you very much for joining, and thank you yep. always, Shane, for helping us dig deeper into the sermon and understand Absolutely. it better and, and so forth yeah, as well. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate right. it. Absolutely. Take care. Have a blessed day. God bless.